When I was a little boy, I liked to collect rocks. And if you have small boys, and I've had three of them, you realize that this is not unusual. When I first started collecting rocks as a child, I was interested in the individual characteristics of each stone, how they looked and how they felt. And then as I got older, I put that aside. And I became more interested in how the stones were quarried and cut and shaped and how they were made to fit together in structures. I actually developed this interest in structures. The crude stone fences and walls in rural Texas where I grew up and then later the buildings and monuments in great architectural cities like Chicago where I lived as an adult. Perhaps the most famous rock collection in the world is Stonehenge. This site is in South Central England and it originally was created as a burial ground about 8,000 BCE by local inhabitants. And evidence suggests that over the ensuing centuries that a number of earthen and wooden monuments were erected there. But around 2600 BCE, those were replaced gradually by these stones that are so familiar to most of us now. Our earliest written Accounts and paintings and drawings of Stonehenge come to us from the early medieval period. One 12th century writer tells us that Stonehenge was the handiwork of Merlin the wizard. In his story, several hundred British noblemen were killed here by the invading Saxons and the grieving king of England sent his army to Ireland because he knew in Ireland there was a monument with these magical African blue stones that giants had placed there, and he wanted those stones for his monument. So he sent his army to Ireland. Of course, they met resistance, and they won the battle, but as you might imagine, they were incapable of, of moving these stones. So he turned to Merlin and asked Merlin you know, what he should do, and Merlin said, no problem. He whisked them over the English Channel with his magic. One note of interest is that the interior stones at Stonehenge <clears throat> actually didn't come from local resources. They were quarried in, in wells, and somehow 5,000 years ago, these four-ton stones were transported 200 miles to the site. More contemporary explanations for where Stonehenge originated has mentioned things like Celtic Druid priests erecting these stones for religious purposes and and actually, modern Druids still gather here annually for the summer solstice to celebrate. The fact is that we're, we don't know who, who, who created this monument, and, and we'll probably never know, or probably never know why, because it, of course, predates the written record. And I'm not going to tell you either, nor am I going to theorize, because I'm neither a geologist or an archaeologist. I'm a physician. And what I really want to talk to you about today is healthcare. But the fascinating thing to me is the similarities between the structure of Stonehenge and that of the modern medical industrial enterprise. This enterprise that we know so well now was also hewn literally by hand from the rough and impersonal stone of disease and suffering. And actually, much like Stonehenge, the structure of modern American healthcare hasn't really changed much the delivery structure for a long time. The natural resources that we use to create the system weren't quarried locally either. If you study medical history, you'll understand that the physicians that created the first medical schools, most of them, and hospitals in this country were all trained on the continent, as they called it, at the great centers of medicine in England and in France. Stonehenge gives us a number of examples of a form of construction called trabeation. This is actually the most ancient load-bearing form of construction that, that we know of. And it consists of vertical pillars supporting horizontal structures called lintels across the top. And until the arrival of the arch around the 3rd century BCE, this dominated worldwide architecture. The interesting thing is that this is the same way that the American medical healthcare industrial enterprise was, was built, exactly the same way. The $3 trillion 
delivery system sits heavily like a lintel on the four pillars on which it was built. I call these the four pillars of medical authority. The first is informational authority. The concept that I, as a healthcare provider, have knowledge that you cannot access or understand. The second pillar is technical authority. That I, as a healthcare provider, have technology that you cannot acquire or use. The third is moral authority, that I'm held in higher esteem. And that all, although I may not be magical, I might be infallible. And the fourth is scientific authority, this idea that dedicated observation and scientific trial and error have gradually replaced what initially was just in the imagination of witch doctors and shaman. These four pillars have stood strong and unchanging, much like Stonehenge, for a hundred years. But I have a little secret to for you that you may not know, and that is that there are cracks in these stones. There are cracks in these stones, and these columns are crumbling for the first time in a century, right before our eyes. Now, some lament this um, because they feel as if, you know, the loss of medical authority and technical authority and uh, informational authority to the masses is dangerous. But others embrace this. They say, well, this is just the natural progression of human competence. And those that feel that way can't wait to actually get their hands on the rubble because they've been imaging a different structure for a long time. And they'll be the architects and the rebuilders of healthcare. Let's look at each one of these pillars in turn, and let's discuss how they might be crumbling. Let's take informational authority first. And so the website WebMD gets 150 million hits per month. It's just a fact that what I learned in medical school, access to that information is not limited to those who go to medical school now. I was once asked by someone, well, what's, how can you compare and contrast WebMD to what you learned in medical school? And I said, well, the information's about the same, but the pictures online are a lot better than the ones I used to see from the back of the pathology classroom on the overhead screen. Research suggests that when lay people access medical information online, that they don't really learn as much as they think. But what I can tell you as someone that spent a long time as a cancer surgeon, it was amazing to me how much someone with an eighth grade education could learn if they felt like their life was in danger. Technical authority. It should be no secret to you that individuals are taking all manners of devices and placing them on their bodies and measuring all sorts of things. Moore's Law, as applied to the digital revolution, Moore's Law, of course, is faster, smaller, cheaper. Digital technology means that we ain't seen nothing yet. That the devices that we're going to be placing on and in our bodies in the future are going to be much more sophisticated and will be giving us insights that we never thought we could get. There are ultrasound devices that aren't much bigger than this slide switcher. If I had a free hand, I'd take my cell phone out and show that to you because that's about the same size. And you can actually scan yourself. Now, you can't read the scan unless you're a radiologist, but I guarantee you that software is being written right now so that you don't have to. For three decades, we've been diagnosing our own pregnancy. And now you can have a lab in an envelope. You can take any bodily fluid or solid that you can generate and put it in an envelope and mail it off and get a test result without a physician having to order anything. What about moral authority? Historians say that there was a strange transference at the, late, at the end of the 19th century where physicians began to take on the imprimatur of Protestant ministers. This is around the time in our society when people begin to think of science as more of a religion. We now know that organized religion is waning everywhere, except for a few pockets in the world, and we also know that this concept that individual liberty is more important than authority got kick-started like crazy in this country in the 1960s on college campuses everywhere. There's absolutely no 
indication that I, that idea's momentum is slowing. We now know that physicians and hospitals make mistakes. We now know that medicine is not a religion and it's not magic. And we know that physicians are neither priests nor Merlin moving stones across the sea. What about scientific authority? This column of the four, I think, is really fared the best, but it's not without some issues. We're told on one day that we should drink coffee because it prevents cancer, and we're told the next day that don't drink coffee, it causes cancer, and we're told the next day we should drink red wine because it helps prevent heart disease, and the next day don't drink red wine, it causes heart disease. Now, the good news is there's this guy named Dr. Oz <laughs> who says if you just take this little pill called Garcinia Cambogia, everything will be fine. Despite those shenanigans, the progress that's being made in understanding human biology and the basic underpinnings of disease accelerates. The CRISPR gene editing system can remove disease-causing DNA from the human genome down to the single base pair. That's coming. We now treat cancer not based on its name, as they did when I was a clinician years ago, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma. We now treat cancer on the basis of its genetic profile. How do the guanines and thymidines and cytosines and adenines, how do they line up? So <clears throat> three of these columns are eroding. It's just a fact. And the other fact is they're not going to be repaired. If we don't do anything, then this heavy lintel of our delivery system paradigm is going to slip off its supports and fall and crash to the ground. So if this is going to happen, if medical Stonehenge is going to fall, how would we rebuild it? What architectural philosophy or structures would we cleave to? I suggest the arch. Scientists that study systems theory tell us that as activities become more complex and less predictable, that hierarchical structures, up and down structures, become less and less effective. I know of no human endeavor more complex or less predictable than medicine. By definition, a pillar and lintel system is hierarchical. The delivery enterprise held up high above the uninformed masses below that have to scramble up and down the lentils to get the help they need and the care that they seek. An arch, however, is different. In an arch, the weight of responsibility for care gets distributed among all the elements, patients, physicians, non-physician providers, and others all sharing the responsibility for care, each being equally important. The mortar that holds the stones together in these structures, or the technologies that are enabling us to communicate data, information between clinicians and patients in the future, patients and patients, and health systems and health systems, and nations and nations, and of course the informational and moral authority that we're handing to the masses powers the ability to do this. In this structure, the job of the healthcare provider is to be one of the constituents, to be a partner. But also in this structure, there's an imperative that healthcare providers actually actively develop the tools that capitalize on the democratization of information and technology and hand them to the masses. Let them diagnose and treat the things that they're capable of doing without the intercession of a clinician, without the need for intercession of a clinician. A few years ago, my oldest son was graduating from high school, and I gave he and four of his friends on graduation day these little cheap, garish bow ties as uh, his graduation presents. And as you might imagine, they were, I can still see them standing around in my house with their gowns on, and they all wanted to wear them underneath their gowns. And so my son, who's six foot five and a college athlete, walks up and goes, Hey, Dad, can you tie this bow tie on me? And I'm like, dude, I can't even see around you in the mirror, but there's this, um, there's this website that's from this haberdashery in South Carolina that I watched a couple of months ago. It had been a while since I'd tied a bow tie. I said, no, it's pretty good. Just take, take, a, take a look. 
I walked out of the room, went to the kitchen, got a glass of water, and came back. And there they were, all five of them with their bow ties tied. Five minutes later. What I'm telling you that if a 17-year-old boy, <laughs> and I say that with love, can do that, can watch a three-minute video, and how many of you have tied a bow tie? It's like six or eight steps. If they can do that, you know what else they can do? They can watch a three-minute video, they can swab their throats, they can put that swab in an envelope and send it off to see if they have, have strep throat. They don't need a provider for that maneuver, necessarily. Monolithic structures, pillar and lintel structures, by definition encourage acquiescence, independence, but an arch is different. By applying gentle pressure at all times and support at all times from all directions, it might be that patients begin to think more about taking responsibility for their own health and for the maintenance of their own health. Do we have to wait for this thing to slip off the supports and fall and crash to the ground into fragments? Might it be easier if we actually actively lowered the monolith down to the ground and shaped the stones to fit in the new structure into the arch? Wouldn't that be better than sifting through the rubble to try to find the pieces that fit? I mean, it might be hard to find the pieces that fit. It's going to take longer, and then they might not fit as well. When I think about my own thought process around the structure of healthcare delivery, I, in, in you know, the philosophical journey and the, I guess the geological journey that I've, that I've gone through, I think about, again, being a little boy and those individual stones and how I was fascinated by their individual characteristics. And then when I got older and wiser, I was interested in the structures and how those stones fit together. And now I find myself back at square one again. And actually thinking about, you know, within structures, the individual components are very important. And in a new structure of healthcare like that's shaped like an arch and works like an arch, each stone is really important. It's the structure and the stone. I read a book several years ago called Invisible Cities, and in that book there's an actually a fictional imagined exchange between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, the aging Chinese emperor. And Marco Polo is explaining to Kublai Khan the structure of a bridge. In China at the time, they had no arch. And so he's explaining the structure of the bridge stone by stone. And Kublai Khan is very rude and very impatient. And he's explaining this, and Kublai Khan goes, which stone supports the bridge? And Marco Polo sort of stands back a little bit, and he goes, well, um, actually, the bridge is not supported by one stone or another. It's the line of the arch that's important. He goes, well, then don't talk to me about stones. All I care about is the arch. Polo stood back for a second, sort of gained his composure and said, Emperor, I'm sorry, but without each individual stone, there is no arch. I'm Dr. Roy Smythe. I'm here to help you change the structure of healthcare one stone at a time. Thanks for listening.